Okay. Good evening. Uh, I'm Greg Jackson, vice chair, and I'm uh, subbing for our chairwoman. Uh, I'd like to call the infrastructure oversight board meeting uh, for August 25th, 2022 to order. Our first order of business is a flag suit, which Ms. Coronado will lead. Please rise and join me in the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, I guess next item is roll call. I think we have a quorum, but. Uh... Armin Avazian? Present. Walter Brennan Jr. Mm -hmm. Maria Coronado? Present. Greg Jackson? Present. Vanessa Rochal? Present. Toma Takahashi is absent. And Jeff Vanderport is running late. All right, we have a quorum. We can continue on with the business. Uh, item C is announcements. Do we have any announcements, Mr. Berkman? I just wanted to introduce everybody to Jackie Montes, who is our uh, secretary for the IOB now. Um, Karina Rosales has, has moved on to another position within the city. So welcome. Yeah, I second that. Welcome. All right. Are there any public comments? I don't think there's anyone of the public, but do we have any online or no? No. Staff is shaking their heads, so I guess we have no public comment. And uh, item 5E, board members' response to public comments. Well, we don't have anything to say. Uh, the consent calendar, item number F, uh, approval of minutes of the prior June 23rd, 2022. Does anyone have any comments, any corrections they would like to see? No. All right. Uh, could I hear a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Mr. Brennan. Second. Okay. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? No one abstaining? Okay. I think that's the new way we can do it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Quicker. All righty. Uh, item G on our agenda is the new Burbank Central Library and Civic Center. Uh, staff will give us an update on that item. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, board members, um, happy to have a uh, very interesting topic for you to hear about with our new Burbank Central Library and Civic Center project. And um, we have our um, library director and finance director here, Elizabeth Goldman and Jennifer Becker. And I believe they're gonna take control at the helm there to do a uh, presentation for you. And Vice Chair, I just wanted to, to make a comment for, for these items since they're reports to the uh, board um, and really just uh, direction for staff to file. There's no uh, formal motion that we need after the conclusion of the item. Right, you, you can ask questions. Correct, you can ask questions. All right, good evening. Thank you for um, letting us adjust in this new setting. Um, my name is Elizabeth Goldman. I'm the Library Services Director for the City of Burbank. And I am very happy to be here this evening to provide the Infrastructure Oversight Board with an update on work toward building a new Burbank Central Library as part of a larger redevelopment of the Civic Center. All right. As many of you are aware, and some of you have even been involved, these efforts have been in progress for many decades in the city of Burbank. Back in 1989, the city conducted a facilities master plan that identified the Central Library, then 26 years old, as in need of modernization and expansion. That resulted in some cosmetic upgrades to paint, carpet, and furniture a few years later. 
But in the 30 years since then, the only investments in the building have been to keep systems basically functional. In 2003, the city developed a concept for a civic centre, which would include a new library, open space and staff offices. The only part of this that was completed was the community services building we're sitting in right now. That same year, voters passed Measure L, approving by more than two-thirds spending for library facility improvements, including the central library. This required matching funds from the state in order to assess the local tax, and Burbank was unfortunately not successful in grant application funds at the time. And then state funding for library buildings was eliminated for many, many years. Some smaller attempts at plans and funding sources were considered in the intervening years, but it wasn't until 2020, another two decades, when the city truly reopened the question and developed the Central Library Vision Study. When that was presented to the City Council in spring 2021, Council gave direction for staff to explore how to make the project financially feasible, which has led to the work we'll be reviewing tonight. The other recent development of significance, of course, was the passage of Measure P in 2018. Having that steady revenue stream for city infrastructure projects makes it possible to move forward with this idea. Tonight, I'm going to share uh, some information about the study and the elements of a modern library that is truly able to meet its community's needs. We'll review the concept for the Burbank Civic Center, which will be presented to City Council in more detail next month. And given that the IOB's role is to advise City Council on use of Fund 534, we'll focus in on plans for those revenues in this context. Your presentation tonight follows a similar one made to the Board of Library Trustees a few weeks ago, which was preceded by a City Council presentation on August 9th about the public-private partnership delivery model that we're recommending to be used in this case. Work is very much in progress and is being conducted by an interdepartmental team involving the library, public works, finance, community development, and others, along with a team of consultants who are represented here tonight on Zoom. Uh, Mr. Hahn has worked closely alongside me in project coordination, and I'd like to thank him and Mr. Bergman for their contributions. The upcoming September Council presentation will be an opportunity for the City Council to provide specific input as plans progress. For IOB, we ask that tonight you focus on the proposed use of Fund 534 for this project. So this is my first opportunity to speak to this group about libraries, so I wanted to share a little bit of background. The current Central Library opened in 1963, almost 60 years ago, at a time when libraries had a very different role. Before the explosion of personal technology and internet access that started in the 1990s, Library buildings were constructed mostly to warehouse books and provide access to physical materials. Today, libraries still have books. They still have staff who offer research and information assistance and still offer programs, particularly for children, but they have expanded to be community and learning centers that have to address a wide range of literacies and community needs. A modern library is built with flexibility and adaptability in mind. We no longer assume we know how exactly the building will be used in 20, 40, or 60 years, but we design it so it can move forward as our world does. We focus less on space for things and more on space for people. We acknowledge different learning styles and needs for different spaces and amenities through the course of a life. And we integrate our offerings very deeply with the community we serve, whether that means partnerships for on-site programs or services, or even in the case of the Calgary Public Library, that's the exterior building here, um, the, library, the physical building of the library is being used to bridge two neighborhoods that were previously split by a metro line. And that's a building that just opened a couple years ago. And the other examples here um, are Austin, Texas, uh, which was built in 2017 with the brightly colored children's area. The bottom slide is a Helsinki, Finland, which notably has trees inside the building on the third floor. It's an amazing inspirational space. And the uh, other bottom one is from Kansas City, Missouri. So in 2021, we conducted this study, a vision for a new Burbank Central Library, which sought to update the city's understanding of needs for use of space. It represented the first comprehensive study of costs as well as public needs and desires in almost 20 years. The city engaged the architectural firm Miller Hull to gather public input through surveys, focus groups, 
an interactive exhibit at the Central Library and community meetings. They reviewed the Central Library's deficiencies to come to the conclusion that renovating the existing building would not be in the city's best interests. And they conducted preliminary estimating of costs for a new building in a couple locations that were being considered at the time. The study presents a vision for a new central library that highlights five themes for consideration in the project. The first is to highlight community identity, that is to bring the friendly and approachable feel of Burbank to the project and to make the library a gathering space. The second is celebrate Burbank's unique history. Burbank is very proud of both its uh, air, airplane production industry and uh, current media industry and thinking about how the things that have shaped Burbank so much can be represented in, in a future library. The third is to capitalize on future opportunities. Um, so building on that history, make sure the central library can support the creative economy. That's such a big part of Burbank today and also make the downtown a civic destination. Fourth, invest in Burbank's next generation to create a space that supports student success and lifelong learning. And finally, invest in the city and use resources responsi responsibly. This speaks to sustainability, fiscal responsibility, and smart planning for a library that will serve Burbank for decades. So when this study was presented to City Council last year, they selected the site across Glen Oaks from the current library as the preferred location for a new library and instructed staff to continue explorations of financial feasibility leading to the launch of the current study. I do wanna note that the Central Library Vision Study was included in your meeting packet, but should you want to refer anyone else to it, it's easily available on the library website, burbanklibrary.org. So what are our current activities? In the summer of 2021, the city engaged a group of consultants led by a firm called Arup to advise on the next phase of this project. Arup notably steered the city of Long Beach through their civic center redevelopment, which included a new central library that opened in 2019 and used a public-private partnership model. That Long Beach project provided inspiration for Burbank to look at the civic center as a comprehensive space rather than a library on its own. The Community Development Department is also working on the downtown Burbank specific plan, which looks at land use in an area that includes the Civic Center and identifies opportunity sites for potential future housing, including several that will be part of this project. As a result, staff have developed proposals based on using the P3 model, which we'll explain in a few minutes, to manage a comprehensive Civic Center redevelopment involving the library, replacement office space for the Administrative Services Building, open space, parking, and both affordable and market rate housing. As part of the current study, we specifically focused on financial feasibility and potential funding sources, including the Measure P revenue that feeds Fund 534. We've all been doing a lot of research to understand this P3 model in detail because it can be applied in various ways and uh, did some analysis of which version of that would best fit this project. And of course, as we are here tonight, we're currently bringing updates to council and relevant boards. So let's go through uh, each aspect of that in a little more detail. First of all, um, this, is, this is the map of a conceptual plan that's based on extensive analysis of how these elements can fit together to meet city goals and needs. It's important to understand this is not a design or necessarily a final layout. Those will come later in the project. But to analyze whether the project works, we needed to develop a conceptual plan and understand how the pieces fit together. This map shows the three blocks between Olive and Orange Grove, starting with the City Hall block to the left, the CSB block we're on now in the center, and where the current library is to the right. The new library is in orange at the corner of Olive and Glen Oaks, with city staff offices on top to replace the current administrative services building. Where ASB was, uh, the downtown gets much needed new open space. Then there are three proposed residential buildings in yellow that add about 475 units of new housing to the area, with one on the lot where the current library stands, one adjacent to the new library, and one adjacent to City Hall where there's currently a parking structure and surface parking. These units are proposed to be 80% market rate and 20% affordable. And then each residential structure has a small amount of commercial space on the ground floor. The public parking moves underground 
um, basically under the library and the residential that's adjacent to it on that block. And then each of the residential buildings has its own parking as well. So notably, along with the adjacencies that make the public amenities convenient for residents, this plan creates a mid-block corridor. Um, if you're looking at Glen Oaks, going in between the buildings behind City Hall, you can imagine that going down to San Fernando. Um, and that connects the whole area in a way that's quite disconnected at the moment. Can I stop you for just one second? I'm having difficulty conceptualizing what we're doing sure. with regards to the street pattern. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't read the streets yep. and I can't find that particular exhibit. Yes. Yeah, so. So the bottom, the bottom horizontal street is olive. Is olive. And the top one is Orange Grove. Okay. And then the one to the right is Glen Oaks and the one to the left is Third Street. Third Street. So okay. CSB is the white building in between the two yellow buildings. Okay. That's where we are right now. Okay, thank that you very help? much. Okay. I apologize. So yeah. does this connect to the mall? You just said that? It doesn't, um, it doesn't connect to the mall. What it does is it creates this mid-block. So right now, if you're standing here, um, there's pathways where you can walk in between the buildings down to San Fernando, but it's not really well connected. It's not really a space that invites you to move back and forth between the San Fernando area and this area of city buildings. So part of the idea of this with the new open space and some wider avenues in between buildings is to really make that connection. People who come visit the library or who live in this area go down to San Fernando, do their shopping and eating, and vice versa. The, um, this is about putting together a, a library, and all of a sudden we have uh, also building, uh, I, I would presume, apartment buildings, uh, things like that. Um, how does that fit in with the library? Well, it's, it. it's what makes the library possible, because the library by itself would be one of Burbank's more expensive projects. And um, we'll explain the financing in a little bit, and you'll see how the pieces fit together. Um, basically, there's some leases on that land that help offset the cost of the public buildings. And the other public elements here are also have been on the list as needs for many, many decades. Okay, that's a, that's a very good question, Mr. Brennan. But um, why don't we hold off for a little bit you know, right. before we pepper uh, staff with, <laughs> okay. with, with questands? Yeah, Mr. Chair just, and, and board members. I was just trying members. to understand yeah. the map. That was all. It'll be, it'll be coming. We'll yes. hopefully be able to piece this okay. together for you so, for some good question and yeah. answers. Thank you. And we Thank can you. bring this back up later yeah. if it's helpful. Okay. All right, so this project does align with a number of established city council goals and plans. Um, the council goal most relevant to this group is infrastructure. This project creates new public amenities that the people of Burbank have been requesting for many, many years, including the updated library and more open space in the downtown area. But rather than doing this in a void, it uses the amenities to strengthen the downtown neighborhood, including both affordable and market rate housing. The project ties into the larger downtown Burbank specific plan, which identifies future goals for land use in the area of the Civic Center and beyond. That plan will be presented to City Council in 2023. A plan council has already approved is the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Plan, and this project supports that. Um, and other sustainability goals by including elements such as solar panels, stormwater capture, recycled water, and more. There's also a council approved plan called Complete Streets, which looks at walkability and bikeability. And this creates a neighborhood where people can live without cars. Um, it's adjacent to bus routes and near the San Fernando corridor, supporting the future of city building. The residents and visitors to these amenities, as I mentioned, will also support those San Fernando restaurants and businesses. Not to mention the improved library will be able to expand our supports for job seekers, technology training and entrepreneurship, overall strengthening Burbank's economy. And finally, all of this supports improved city services and the quality of life for Burbank as a whole. So next we wanna explain um, briefly about this public-private partnership model. And at this point, I would like to invite our consultant, Mr. Orion Fulton, who is on Zoom, to explain P3s.
I, or, and we don't have sound yet, so give us just a second. All right, just bear with us for a minute, please. All right, um, Orion, can you please try again? Sure, can you hear me okay? Yes, it's great now, thank you. All right, um, still in the hybrid meeting world. Um, nice to see you all uh, and a pleasure to present to you tonight. Um, so when we're working with clients, public clients like the city of Burbank, um, there are are almost always questions about when we're looking at feasibility of projects is how do you deliver these projects? So you under, you can understand the feasibility in terms of, of costs, you know, and, and funding sources, and, and you can understand the project, especially from a first cost perspective. How much will it cost me to build this new library in this civic plaza, in this new parking? Um, but what oftentimes is missed is how much is this going to cost me to maintain over the life of this asset? Uh, these assets are, have useful lives, designed to useful lives of 65, 70 years. Um, and, and unfortunately, all too often, cities like Burbank um, find themselves struggling to continue to maintain assets over the long term. So why do we talk about P3s? Well, one of the main reasons is um, they are a hedge against asset deterioration over time. And I'll talk a little bit about why. And, and why is that such a major risk? Um, you know, the other is that um, P3s really help with transferring risk during construction. So they, they employ a design build method of construction whereby the developer has a turnkey lump sum contract uh, and they are paid when the asset is delivered. Um, so those two, those two areas, both the long-term asset preservation and the upfront design and construction risk are two of the biggest, uh, benefits that, um, entities like the city of Burbank are seeking when they're ex examining and, and, and entertaining the P3 concept. Um, another big reason why we look at P3s is how to evaluate and ultimately, let's use the word, optimize the first cost versus those life cycle long-term costs. And um, done in a traditional method, uh, we oftentimes try to drive towards what can we afford today. And we don't think about what that may mean later in terms of replacement or maintenance costs. So P3s, uh, are beneficial in that they we they ultimately ask a development entity uh, to oversee both that the the design and the costing of the first cost as well as estimating and predicting the long term cost for operations maintenance and and life cycle replacement and you ask them to help you evaluate the trade offs. I think the classic example is flooring, right? Um, a seven-year cycle on carpet versus a hundred-year life of terrazzo tile. Now, those have very different first costs and very different maintenance costs to, to get a, a, an idea of what we're talking about. Um, the other the other benefit is when you do a P, when you're procuring a, a, a developer uh, to build things for you in a P3, when you're evaluating trade-offs and costs you're looking at them all together so when you're making this decision you're making it you're making a decision about 
what it will cost over the life cycle and you're making a commitment to those costs. Um, so one important thing about um, P3s is that you, uh, a, a public owner like the city, uh, you elect to uh, enter into a contract to not only have that benefit of the design build, but also that you are making commitments to pay back not only the capital for that construction, but also to continue to make a stream of payments to help that developer adequately maintain and operate that facility for you. Um, and that's in the contract. So it doesn't become, it's not a, a necessarily an, a, a discretionary decision every annual budget. It's, the com it's a long-term commitment to, to maintaining that asset. Um, but the benefit you get is there's no asset deterioration and you're not facing a potential capital replacement project 30, 40 years later, um, which sometimes is, is the case. Um, so that performance-based contracting concept of making that commitment to pay for performance over time is, is a very central theme in, in, in public-private partnerships. Um, another element to that is the developer doesn't, just get a guaranteed payment. They have to not only perform that design build work, but they get paid back annually to an agreed upon stream of payments from the city. So the benefit there is if they're not performing during the O&M period, there, there can be, you can deduct things. So let's say that you don't, that the staff find they don't have the ability to use the facility the way they want it. There's a HVAC problem or the elevator's not working. There are penalties that that the developer will pay um, if that occurs, and so ultimately, it's not about developer bashing as much as it is that there are strong contractual incentives for the developer to not let that happen, and therefore you get a a strong incentive for them to keep everything in in tip top shape, and therefore the developer always receives their payment. Um, and and that you have a a, a well maintained quality asset and and that so the p in that sense the p3 structure makes a lot of sense for a, a facility like a library that is the public face of of the city. Um, the final point on performance based contracting is that and Jennifer will speak later on the financing, but you have a very clear, steady, uh, predictable stream of payments that you can plan for. And that actually helps cities quite a bit um, on, for financial planning long term. Now, as I said before, that also locks you into certain um, that locks you into certain payments that you won't have that the city wouldn't have discretion over. However, um, the long term benefit of the of of protecting against asset deterioration is not a that's not a hundreds of thousands of dollars question. That that actually we're talking about for a facility like this, millions of dollars uh, preserved over time. A um, couple final points. P3s take advantage of private financing or what we call in the industry project financing where the, the loan, the, the, the borrowers are, bar, uh, um, sorry, the lenders are lending money in the context of the P3 contract itself. So it's not a, it's not a bondholder buying uh, bonds against the general credit of the city. It's that they, the lenders, believe that the P3 contract and the developer who needs to deliver it is a well put together plan that presents as little risk as possible to those lenders. And ultimately, the, the benefit you get is the lenders overseeing the project, just like they would a traditional construction loan or for that matter, even the due diligence they'd provide when you get a mortgage on a house. They want to see good credit, good performance, in, you know, historical performance, and they ultimately become a, um, an ally to the city in ensuring that the, the contractor delivers on their obligations in the, in the contract. Um, they insist on things like, you know, strong guarantees from the contractor. They look at the track record of the facility maintenance provider the developer works with. Um, so again, private financing equals the, the benefit of lender oversight. And then finally, what we've seen um, 
as advisors uh, to major projects that have that are looking at P3s is a a real trend for public entities to use P3s as a vehicle for um, hybrid development. So that's where you're developing a public asset, but you're bringing into that that public project um, the creation of private development opportunities that that not only generate revenue streams that can help offset the costs of the public project, but they also help accomplish economic development goals, um, such as bringing housing downtown in the city of, 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 um, of Burbank. Um, they also help, um, they also help accelerate projects that otherwise could take individually could take a very long time to come to market. And this sort of, this, they call them hybrids because you have a, you have the the public facility is one of the key delivering the public facility is one of the key uh, goals, but it is also um, by bundling with other projects you get you gain the benefit of other policy objectives, economic development, housing, um, offsetting public costs, um, and ultimately getting you know efficiencies such as like. Uh, and and more market interest um, to to provide competitive bids, um, so that's a quick sort of tutorial on on why we're talking about P3s and how they might benefit uh, this project. Back to you, Elizabeth. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. Oh, do you don't have your mic on. Oh, will you be staying with us for for a while so we can ask some questions of you? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Great, oh, no problem. Thank you. So next I'd like to uh, hand it over to Ms. Becker to explain um, the financial analysis we've done and use of 534. Good evening, Vice Chair and members of the board. I'm Jennifer Becker, Financial Services Director, and of course we all know which portion of this project I'm here to talk about. Um, <clears throat> the biggest question on everyone's minds when it comes to a project of this scale is the price tag and whether this is something that the city can reasonably afford. Our best estimates at this time put the cost of this project at around $116 million, uh, which includes the library and ASB facilities as well as the parking and open space. Uh, these costs were factored in 2022 dollars, so of course as we continue along this uh, timeline of this project, those numbers are of course subject to change. Now, like most cities, uh, Burbank does not have $116 million in cash lying around. Uh, certainly, if we did, I'd have a much easier job, and this would be a much different discussion. Um, in a traditional project structure, the city would go out and seek to issue debt to build itself a library, and it would pay that debt back over a 30-year period. But like Orion said, one of the big advantages of the P3 structure is that the developer is responsible for financing the project. Uh, the city would have an annual payment obligation to the developer. Oh. Sorry. The city would have that annual payment obligation to the developer and would report this liability on the city's financials. But since the debt does not reside with the city, it would not count towards our debt capacity or limit the city's ability to issue other debt in the future for other projects. And of course, the revenues received from the ground leases for the housing would help offset the city's annual payments for this obligation and would continue to be a revenue stream for the city even after the debt obligation is paid off. So the passage of Measure P provided a stable stream of revenue to the Municipal Infrastructure Fund, which would allow the city to meet the payment obligations for the Civic Center project without using general fund dollars, thus avoiding any potential financial impact to other cities' programs and services. However, staff understands that the use of Fund 534 revenue for this project has to be balanced against the many other needs and obligations for these very valuable infrastructure dollars. Go to the next slide. Thanks. So here's our financial plan that staff will be proposing as part of the Civic Center project. Uh, first, uh, we are requesting that we would like to commit $10 million of municipal infrastructure fund balance into a set-aside account in order to secure the city's portion of the matching funds that would be required if Burbank is successful in securing the library grant. Uh, this would help fund the milestone payment, which is essentially the one-time portion or the upfront down payment for this project. A second, we have the recurring costs of the project to contend with. 
based on an analysis of current spending levels and future projected expenses for the infrastructure fund. We feel that the city can reasonably commit about 25% of fund 534's annual revenues towards the city's payment obligation for this project. Uh, this is net of the ground lease revenue. This portion will, of course, decrease over time as both the revenues from the ground leases and our overall Measure P revenues continue to increase over time. And I should note also that um, while this annual payment includes the, uh, the annual maintenance and life cycle replacement for the project, what it doesn't factor in is the savings that the city will achieve by eliminating both the old Central Library and the old ASB project, which of course are uh, high maintenance, older buildings, which require a lot of upkeep. And of course are not at all sustainably efficient. Uh, and of course, after the 30 years of payment obligations are complete, the city would retain the ground lease revenues as a new permanent funding stream for potential future infrastructure projects. Oh, sorry. All right, thank you, Ms. Becker. Um, so with that, we'd just like to wrap up um, by giving you a little bit of an upcoming project schedule. Um, all dates, of course, are subject to change, but uh, at this point, we intend to give a full project update to City Council on September 13th, so that will be tonight, but much more diving into a lot more detail about every element. Um, this fall, we're going to continue our research and analysis, focusing on a few specific areas that have been identified, and this will include opportunities for the public to provide some input, uh, particularly around sustainability goals and the plans for the library and the open spaces. We know that the election will bring some changes to our city council, so we plan to take another update to the city council in the spring, after which if we um, are successful with approval there, staff will begin the procurement process through a request for qualifications and request for proposals process. Ultimately, once a development partner has been selected through that competitive process and the city has negotiated a contract, we can finally get to the long awaited design and construction the library and other public amenities are targeted to open around 2027, along with the first residential structure, and the other residential buildings will be constructed on a staggered schedule over the five to six years after that date. So that's, and that is when, at the end of that period, is when we see the full benefits of those ground leases that can offset the annual costs. So thank you very much for your attention to this, and we look forward to hearing your discussion about this project and all three of us, as well as um, the public works staff who've been assisting with this project are available to answer questions about the infrastructure aspects of this, the proposed use of Fund 534. Thank you. All right, well, thank you for a very uh, good presentation. A lot of information for us to uh, mull over. Um, I believe, Mr. Brennan, you started with some questions, so why don't we lead off with you? Thank you, Craig. Um, one question I have in talking about get this library belt built and then uh, additional housing for whoever, how does that affect the school district? Um, well, I wouldn't want to answer on behalf of the school also district. Will be contributing to building buildings for their schools? Um, the school district, uh, based on my understanding over the past several years, the school district has continued to see declining enrollment and does not have any strain on its system. That's not a good excuse. You can't expect well, I'm, I'm, because I'm, if you're going to build buildings, people are probably, I mean, sure. housing, folks are going to want to bring their kids along with them or else have kids after they move in. So theoretically, uh, yes, maybe the last couple of years because of the pandemic, there's been a decrease in attendance but that's probably gonna correct itself after everybody gets over the pandemic. So I will note that all city plans in terms of projecting housing and meeting the city council stated housing goals do incorporate and consider the school district's needs. Okay, and then um, talked about um, our, uh, the city's commitment to making uh, payments on the uh, building is that um, this is going to decrease over time because of uh, property that's being leased for housing? Well, the or payment itself. I that? In other words, uh, Fund 34, 534, was right. that what I was saying? This is going to help with the payment of the new library, and I presume incorporated this is like the housing that you're going to build that's going to be on leased property, that's going to pay for it too. 
Correct. So the city will have an annual payment obligation uh, for both the financing and the maintenance and life cycle costs of the library. Um, offsetting that annual payment will be revenue received from the ground leases for each of the housing uh, buildings. Now, over time, of course, leases, as we all know, rents don't decrease over time for the most part, right? Well, so over time, we will see those rents increase, which means that portion of the revenue uh, will increase over time as well. In addition, the annual payment, the, the payment obligation is like a fixed payment, kind of like your mortgage, right? So that stays consistent over time. While, of course, the sales tax revenues that come into Fund 534 as part of Measure P will continue to increase. Now, the annual maintenance does have an inflationary mm -hmm. uh, piece, so that's the only port of our portion of our annual payment that will increase over time. But it's likely that the revenues, both from 534 in general and from the ground leases, will uh, increase to keep up with that. Oh, wonderful. Final question would be, um, say 10, 15 years down the road, mm -hmm. you come up with a great new concept, will this building be amenable to like an improvement? Let's say you've come up with a great idea on how to improve it, will we be able to do that? Or you, will the city be able to do that? Not because something's bad with the program, but you come up with a great idea to improve it. Well, the answer to that certainly depends a little bit on the scope of your idea. For instance, if you wanted to add a retractable roof, then that would be a very, a very expensive addition. Um, in terms of the general uses, though, as services, especially, I mean, I'll speak specifically to the library portion, as services change, what I think we've learned from the buildings like our current one and many of the libraries around the country that were built in the mid-century is that uh, they were built assuming things wouldn't change, and now things are changing every single year. So library design and space planning these days is very much about flexible spaces, um, being able to, even over the course of a day, never mind the life of the building, to be able so to change the use and design. adapt. Absolutely, I, I would not feel right about Burbank getting a library that is going to pin us down to the world of 2022 or 2027 or Very whenever. Well. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Brennan. Does anyone else of our group have questions? Mr. Vandenberg? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, my question, I think, is for us as closer, of course, of course. My question for us as a board that is, you know, our oversight responsibility is being uh, sought here for an advice to the council. You know, it goes without saying that this is a momentous project that is more than once in a generation. This is a multi-generational project. And I think that when you came to us with the library needs about a year or so ago, you know, we were all very excited about it. And now here, the rubber hits the road. And we have to ask ourselves as a board, you know, do we want to set aside 25% of the funds that come in for this project? Is this the, the right thing to do? to tell the council, yes, we do, or no, we don't. Uh, I think that's our biggest question. The details of the project are fantastic. They're terrific. You know, there's an opportunity for design. I mean, you talked about connectivity to downtown, et cetera. I know those are big words, and ultimately, it's how the design develops. You know, I'm thinking of the existing parking structures that appear to be uh, showing to disappear, and new, new ones will happen. You know, thank goodness for that. They're, we're long in need of, of replacing those old parking structures there. Um, I personally view this, and correct me if I'm wrong for staff, is that we're looking at a commitment of at least 40 years of the fund money, because where you're asking for money that already has started to accrue, in other words, we have our little piggy bank that has, what, $15 million or so now, and you're asking to take $10 million of that, then you're saying set aside, continue to set aside that money now, even though the 30-year period of responsibility won't start for another five, six, seven years. So it's really a 40-year commitment of money. And I think that's what we as a board, that's from my perspective, and my, you know, I'll, anything my colleagues add in addition to the questions of the specific project is what we have to ask ourselves. Is this worthwhile? You know, my heart <laughs> tells me, of course it is. It's fantastic. You know, what an opportunity to develop. My uh, uh, 
real, realization of being old, you know, being a 70-year-old person who's lived through, through this community for the last 55 years or 50 years is that, yeah, hopefully it will be. I mean, it, it has to be. We have to improve things. We need a, a civic center. We need that open space that, that attracts people, but it needs to be designed with utmost care, and I, and I hope it happens. You know, I, I won't be around when this, you know, 30 years from now to see what the, what the value of it is, but, but I think it has the value. I think this is where we spend the 25%, and we just recognize that, you know, I, I asked Mr. You know, Mr. Hunt to send me information because I, did, I was away to look at all the other unfunded projects, and I don't know if you guys have had an opportunity to look at those, and, you, and, and I mean, you know, and our board members and our staff is continually looking at them, but there are a lot of other projects that are worthwhile as well. So we have to just simply say, you know, where do you start? This is something that we need as a community. The opportunity to make it all happen uh, is fantastic. I'm, you know, our consultant talks about the, all the benefits of the P3 system, which I totally can understand, you know, the private uh, world is primarily intending to survive and make money so lenders don't want to lend to a project that doesn't have a good contractor and doesn't have a, uh, or a good uh, developer. But none of us guarantees that we will be successful. You know, this is really a long, long road that in my opinion, uh, we will really have to be extra careful to ensure that we, we receive the most for our money. But from my gut feeling, I think that as long as we recognize that we're taking you know, a quarter of the revenue that this uh, Measure P is raising uh, and that we are committing it for like a 40-year term, not a 30-year, but a 40-year term. And I think we ask ourselves, do we want to do that? You know, my inclination is yes, but I certainly defer to any other thoughts from my colleagues to see if anybody else has any other ideas or thoughts. And then the specifics of the project, gosh, I, I don't know that we, you know, will have enough time to, to go through them uh, at any time, because it, it's a very detailed project. Um, you know, the issue of housing brings to your question, Mr. Brennan, about the impact of schools. I mean, obviously, there are impact, uh, school impact fees that will be paid for each housing unit that will help the school district. But I also know that right now, they'd welcome hundreds of more students. I mean, we, they're going through a process of eliminating staff because they don't have enough students at uh, uh, Burbank Middle School, you know, and Luther, Luther Burbank, and other problems like that. So I, I think this is the right thing to do. We're desperate for housing uh, as a community, as a city. Uh, I mean, I know it means more people, you know, and there's, there's, it needs more demand for water. It means so many other issues, but we are already committed to life in the city, in this environment, in, in this urban environment, and I think to that, in that respect, again, I'm, I'm for this. Thank you. I'm sorry to be so long to say I'm for it. No, that's very thoughtful comments. Uh, do we have other questions? Oh, Mr. Brennan, again. Yeah, just one comment about what my colleague was talking about here. In thinking in terms of your financing, it looks like you expect that your financing from the ground leases to increase over time, which it should, knowing how rents go anyway. So theoretically, that should help to off-balance any cost that comes out of uh, the 534 fund. And maybe that 25% goes down over time because this will definitely, those leases will definitely go up over time. So theoretically, um, what you presented is a great idea. Thank you. That's our projection for the ground lease revenue, of course, to increase over time, as will our maintenance costs. So we have to balance that against each other. Uh, I should point out to you an important factor, and like Mr. Vandervoort said, it is difficult to project what life will be like 30 years from now when the, or 35 years from now when the project is fully paid off. But I should point out that the ground leases remain after the debt obligation goes away. So that is a revenue stream that will then be there for the city to fund future infrastructure projects that doesn't exist today. All right, thank you. Uh, Ms. Chavez, I think you had a question. I have a couple of questions. Um, you mentioned about affordable housing. Um, have you considered what's the ratio of the affordable housing? Sure, Orion, do you want to take that one? Sure, we, so we evaluated a range of 
um, ratios, looking at um, sort of at the inclusionary housing ratio, kind of 85-15, all the way up to um, um, a ratio of 25% of affordable, um, and what some of the trade-offs were economically. Um, and um, through some analysis done by our, um, our real estate economist, uh, Bay Area, or their BAE Urban Economics, um, we landed on an 80-20 ratio. Um, and the sort of the main reasons for that are um, it maximizes, it, it, it enables the housing projects to take advantage of density bonuses. Um, it also allows them to access some of the um, um, federal uh, tax programs to help offset costs for affordable housing. Um, we have not done a detailed analysis of what level, what income levels that would cover. I think we ran the analysis at, at 80% AMI as an average. Um, but um, based on the preliminary, preliminary um, work, the 80-20 ratio, so 20% affordable seems to be the right place to maximize affordable housing while also generating sort of positive cash flow from the ground leases. Um, the next question I had, uh, you mentioned in the P3 uh, description uh, that there was a design and construction risks are transferred to the developers. Can you give us like a couple of examples of what kind of risks you mean? Yeah, uh, well, the big ones are, are budget and schedule. So if once they've, once the design builder has a, a, a fixed price and the contract is executed, that's the budget. Um, now the owner, the, the owner can request changes if they'd like, but the prod, the, the contractor is responsible for a um, fixed price date certain uh, delivery. Uh, and that promise is not necessarily just to the city. It's also to the banks and their, the, uh, developer entity. Um, and the contract has incentives and penalties if they're, if they're late. Um, so those are the, those are the big ones. Um, there are, there are others that, that we could, we could get into if we had more time, but I'll leave it at that. match. Uh, what's the amount of the grant that you are seeking for and from which agency? Um, the grant is also a $10, $10 million grant. So for the first time in about 15 years, the state, leg the state passed as part of its budget last fiscal year funding for library infrastructure grants. It's being managed by the California State Library. And, the, you are, uh, and cities were allowed to request up to $10 million with, um, in our case, a one-to-one -one match requirement. The match requirements are based on um, per capita income levels in the community. So if we were a more impoverished community, we'd have a lower match, but for Burbank, it would be one-to-one. -one. So we've requested $10 million and 10 million would be the match. And we're hoping to hear about that grant within the next few weeks. And um, there is no restriction to how to use these funds, even though we are choosing to use the public-private partnership uh, there isn't that type of restriction. There is a timeline restriction on it, so we would use the money at the early part of the construction, and obviously it needs to be spent on the library portion of the project. But the library building itself certainly is expensive enough that that uh, th these funds will it will adequately be able to match the funds with the uses. Right. And uh, my last question was: Do we know um, or have an estimate of our commitment, annual commitment, throughout the fourteen years, forty years that we were talking about? From 534? Yeah. Um, yeah, the est well, the estimate is the estimated annual costs over that time is about $7.8 million a year. About $2 million of that should be offset by the ground leases. So it's, it's uh, $5.8 million is the number. Um, and we decided, we, try, we tried to look at it as this 25% because um, in the early years, we won't have all of that ground lease. So it's going to five, the obligation on Fund 534 is a little higher to begin with. Then the ground leases come on, and as Ms. Becker noted, you know, as um, those ground leases go up, 
And most of that annual amount is the fixed cost paying off the debt, and a small portion of it is the operations maintenance and life cycle replacement costs. So the latter part of that continues to increase with um, consumer price index, but the basic payment stays the same. So over time, it flips so that it's less than um, the 5.8 million is not always 25%, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Thank you. I have All a quick right. question about um, transportation. How the design of this, how does that, um, how was um, transportation taken into consideration? And are, is there any grant funding available um, if it's close enough to transit? We certainly hope so. Um, as this project becomes more, uh, more concrete, then we're definitely going to be looking at other grant sources for many, many areas, everything from transit to stormwater, um, other environmental features, the park and open space. There's, I think, lots of opportunities out there. The um, proposed bus rapid transit, I know not a popular subject in Burbank, but on that proposed route, it comes to Glen Oaks and it turns on Olive. Currently, the proposed station is a little bit further down Olive, but it'll be right in this area, and it creates a really great uh, center for a lot of bus lines already are coming through the area. There's connection to the Metrolink station. Um, people who are living right downtown will be able to use any of those modes to um, travel to downtown LA, go to work, whatever is going on. And then, of course, uh, again, we're not in the design phase, but based on the city's complete street goals, uh, we would certainly anticipate that there would be improvements around uh, things like bike lanes in the area as part of the redevelopment. That's excellent. It's important to think about um, first and final mile when we build these, and also for those who um, work outside of Burbank and coming, taking uh, MetroLink, and then using our local um, our local munis to to get home. So that's that's outstanding. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe we'll need to have parking spaces for our hoverboards you know, in the future. Uh, do you, do you have any questions? All my questions were answered. Thank you. Okay. Well, I, I have a few questions. Um, in, in, in your report, you talk about 30 years out, and Mr. Vandenberg correctly pointed out this really 37 to 40 years. What happens after that period of time? Um, the, so, yes, yeah, so the yeah. 30 years is the length of the contract, but yes, you're yeah. correct. The what contract doesn't start on day years? one. Um, after that time, the um, the assets, they're always owned by the city, the public assets, the library building and open space, um, but they're being main, operated and maintained by the private developer. So after that time, the city takes that responsibility back. The, it, you basically sever the relationship and it just becomes like any other city building. Now, one of the real benefits of this system is that uh, based on how the contract is written, we can expect at the end of that 30 years of operation that the building is still in exceptionally good condition. Um, like 80% of perfect. And, uh, and so we know that then it's gonna have another, a solid, another 35, 40 years of life in it, um, as opposed to some other buildings that sometimes deteriorate a lot faster than they should in that kind of time period. Um, then the private residential part of it is the ground leases for that would be longer than the 30 years. Those are generally uh, going to be more like 65 years. That's just based on industry standard for developers not gonna come in uh, for a shorter uh, period to put their private development on that public land. So that's why the ground leases continue after that contractual period. Okay, um, so the ground leases will be for the residential component of this. Correct. The nearly 500 units. Yes, and the city retains ownership of all of the property. Okay. Um, I'm still not 100% clear which properties are in question, but that, that's not necessary at this moment. But I assume that they're, since they're city-owned and they're in the downtown center, they're not zoned for residential. How are we going to get over that hurdle? Are we going to do a zone change to that area? Um, the, the way to get over that hurdle is coordination with the downtown Burbank specific plan that is also well underway at this point in time. So that plan is going to, is the main goal of it is to look at the land uses in the down, downtown area, which is bigger than the civic center. Um, and as part of that, because of the state's expectations of communities like ours to increase our housing, um, the Community Development Department and its consultants are looking at opportunity sites for future housing 
every one of the sites that's included in this is listed in that project as an opportunity site. Um, and so that, that is the, the means by which the zoning will be changed and we're coordinating this project so that that will happen before we are moving into the actual procurement for this. Through a plan development type of... Uh, yeah, it's not exactly, not a plan. <laughs> I, do, I don't think it's technically a plan development, but it's within the specific plans which are part of the general plan, which mm -hmm. defines the land use for every okay. parcel in Burbank. Yeah, okay. I'm sure you're aware that the city is being sued over uh, the uh, ice rink property. Um, all right. Um, I, since we're going through all those machinations, I assume an EIR is being prepared for this project? And the EIR, at least the majority of it, should also be part of the downtown plan. So by identifying this project as one of the components of that downtown specific plan, um, it gets lumped into the overall environmental review mm -hmm. for all of the projects in that area. There may be, once the pro this project is designed to a little more detail, there may be supplemental environmental review that's required, but we won't know that till a little further down the road. Okay. And uh, to, to pick up on a point Mr. Brennan commented about, about the uh, impact on schools and other parts of our infrastructure. I mean, this is not standing alone. I mean, we have the old IKEA site, we have the old Fry site, we have the site that's under construction on First Street. Uh, we have the site that's under construction on uh, whatever the heck the street is that's right by the uh, railroad uh, stop. Uh, so we, we have probably several thousand units that are coming online over the next few years. And that's going to, you know, we're not going to water our lawns next month. And so it's a question, you know, how much that will impact our infrastructure, will our police and fire response times be what they are now or will they be degraded uh, over the course of the, all this construction? Okay. Um, who has final say on materials and finishes? And maybe our consultant might be able to. Why I ask that is, uh, you know, I've been around for a while and in my experience, you know, if things get tight, developers do what's called, you know, cost engineering and what the public has been sold for the nice drawings that have been presented winds up being a little less luxurious. Uh, is the city going to be the final arbiter or is the developer going to be able to switch materials? And Orion, are you still with us? Yep, I'm here. Okay. Would you like to answer that question? Yeah, it's, um, it's a great question. Um, no, the developer cannot get out of what they promised when we signed the contract. And uh, the way that, the, in practice, the way that works is a series of, you know, design reviews and uh, proprietary design reviews and ultimately um, checking in the field that, you know, what's being built is what was in the contract. Um, so that's one of the benefits of, of the P3 is the contractor doesn't get to make those decisions later when the money gets tight. They have to find the money if they uh, overspend. But the uh, trade-off is that you have to know what you're asking for up front. You don't get to, you can change your mind, but that might be a change order. Um, but there needs to be more discipline and planning up front by the city to make sure they're asking for what they want. And uh, Mr. Chair, if I may, within the process of the P3, the beauty from an engineer's standpoint is, is the design build process where they have, we have the opportunity to see what fit and finishes are specifically there versus the O&M lifetime. As, as Orion mentioned in the beginning, that kind of flexibility and relying on the expertise of the concessionaire team and their experience in building these mega projects like we're looking at uh, is very helpful to make sure we make the right decision, not just for Ooh, look at the pretty picture, there it is, but also well, you got to maintain that for 30, 40 years. Um, so that's one of the inherent uh, uh, benefits of this delivery model. Construction team. Will the city have a uh, oversight person and other than just 
uh, you <laughs> can, or, or, or someone else. I mean, someone who is truly knowledgeable about this magnitude of construction. Uh, Mr. Chair, absolutely. That is uh, the same way as this process um, the, the, is a big answer to we don't have the experience or expertise to do this multi-generational type of project. We rely on the industry to help us craft this scope, budget, and schedule on operations and maintenance. And we rely similarly on an independent party to make sure somebody's checking up on the, on the concessionaire team to make sure they're doing it right, construction management, inspection, and et cetera. Okay. All right, um, I, ha I have one final question. The present main library is over 50 years old, and that kicks off historical uh, significance. Uh, have we looked into that to see, uh, indeed, is this historic and can't be demolished as proposed under you know, the plan that you've been? We have not done that in detail yet, but that is one of the studies that will be starting up um, imminently this fall. Okay. Well, that's my questions. Do anyone else have? Uh, well, we thank you all for being here this evening, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing what happens in the future. Maybe thank you not so much. 45 thank you. years. Uh, but, uh. <laughs> and I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Um, Elizabeth, did we mention when this is going to council for their update? We did. Okay, thank you. As of today, it's September 13th. That item is over, and we are now moving, marching on to uh, G2, which is the fourth quarter year-end report for the fiscal year 21-22. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Chair and board members, we're happy to present what is really the, uh, the year-end report, and uh, excited at the work we've, we've done and uh, excited to present it to you as your quarterly update. And with that, I'll introduce Capital Projects Program Manager, Mr. Hoon Han. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Vice Chair Jackson and members of the board. My name is Hoon Han, the Capital Projects Program Manager. Uh, tonight I have before you, like Mr. Bergman said, that um, it's an overview of the capital program for fiscal year 21-22. Closer? Okay. So we actually included all the budget information, and the budget information is a year-end budget information as of June 30th. And um, so all the project information has the budgeted uh, information, uh, the total spent, and also the available funds for each individual project. Um, and many of these projects are actually in the procurement phase in that um, we're, we're working with purchasing um, to put the bid document together and um, to be able to put the, uh, the bid package together and for advertisement. So uh, many of them, like I said, should be going into construction probably in the next four to six months. Um, I'm going to, so the, um, we had the Maxim Memorial uh, project that's kind of midway down. Um, that's actually wood purchasing right now and we're finalizing the bid document. Uh, City Art Service Building, uh, we're actually finalizing the RFP to get the contractor on board, so that should be moving forward relatively soon. Um, and also the going on top, the McCambridge pool, um, Park Pool Repair work, uh, we're actually going to be starting the design work, and construction should start in August of 2020, uh, 2023 on that. Going to the transportation projects. We have the fiscal year annual residential paving project that's actually in construction at this time. And then we have the arterial, annual arterial pavement uh, rehab project that's actually, uh, we're finalizing the bid document and that should be going in for advertisement within the next, towards the end of the month. Uh, I think it'll be uh, probably towards the end of the month, beginning of the, uh, possibly in September. Uh, we have the 2122 sidewalk uh, rehab project that's actually um, contracts been awarded went to council and that should be starting construction within the next couple months uh, Glen Oaks Boulevard arterial project that's actually we're finalizing the the bid document also uh, we started the actually the um, the procurement phase where we uh, bought the um, 
the material uh, for that, for the pole, and that's the process uh, started earlier because of the, there's a long lead time in getting the uh, material for that. And just going through, um, we have other projects that are actually in design uh, moving forward, such as the First Street Class 4 bike lane. Uh, that project actually has been com combined with the Bonniewood Closure Project because it's in the same area. So we have the same consultant doing the design work for that. Um, Chandler Bikeway Extension, um, the RFP process has started. Uh, we're, uh, CDD is working on that. Uh, we have the Downtown San Fernando uh, Boulevard Reconfiguration. Uh, it's a phase one. We have a consultant on board working and putting some concept studies together for us. Um, and then we have the Olive Sparks Verdugo Intersection Improvement Project. Uh, we have actually um, the original concept for that. Um, I believe the the layout wasn't quite. It wasn't going to work. Uh, so we actually br brought a another consultant to kind of do a new layout for us and to the study. Um, and then the San Fernando Bikeway. Uh, Well, the the layout was they laid it out based on the recommendation. I think what the council direction gave, um, what the council direction was. But the um, the current traffic engineer um, he did some study, and he didn't see a true benefit in what the uh, recommendation was. So we're trying to maximize and and make the intersection uh, work better. So we don't want to just do something and make it the same. So we want to make sure that it's it's a uh, a better design. In short, it wasn't the consultant's error. Oh, my it's, apologies. So it's not something to refund them. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thanks. And then we have the San Fernando Bikeway project that's actually in design at this time. I believe it's around with 60% plans. And then with parks projects, we have many projects. Actually, most of the projects that parks work on, they do uh, what's known as a co-op. Uh, procurement process where we piggyback off of other contracts that the uh, other agencies actually have. And so many of these are actually in the procurement, negotiating uh, the final phase of the contract and working with the city attorney's office to uh, move these projects along. Um, the Brace Canyon Park ball field project, I believe the public outreach was completed for that project. And they're moving forward with, uh, with the design phase of that. Um, the Burbank Little Theater renovation project is actually on hold. Uh, they're actually waiting for the finalization of the Olive Recre uh, Recreation Center redesign project. They've, they've done the public outreach, they've done some master planning, and they're going to try to move forward and kind of fold the uh, Burbank Little Theater renovation project as one project. It's, since it's in the same area. Um, and the community garden, uh, the first phase was completed. They're actually working on a second phase, uh, second uh, community garden also for that. And then Dick Clark Dog Park, uh, that project is on hold because of the LA City, um, their project, the sewer project, because it's the, uh, the dog park's gonna go above that facility. And this is just the highlight of, I believe you've seen many of these slides. So all these projects are basically from the, throughout the entire year, Isaiah Miller Gross Park Playground Renovation. As you can see, Isaiah, you have the before project, uh, before the project and, and after. And then also Miller Park, this is the before, and then there's also cost information associated and the, uh, when it was completed. And then when it was uh, after, and then we have Gross Park, that's before, and then after, and you can see the big difference in, in what they've done. And then we have the Bell Driving Range, it, the cost was 275,000 to complete, then they completed in July, January of 2022. And you'll see, you've seen some of these pictures, but you can see this is, I mean, huge improvement and actually somewhere that I wouldn't mind going and hitting some balls too. <laughs> and then we have the DeBell Golf Netting Replacement and Bunker Improvement Project at the before and after. So the netting you could see definitely make that particular street safer for pedestrians and also for uh, 
vehicles. Then you have Maxim Park lighting modernization and uh, the improvements on the lighting for the park and the costs associated with that. It was 143,000 and it was completed in October of 2021. And then we have the uh, ball field lighting, Isaiah and Valley Park, and you can see the big difference uh, or big improvement on Isaiah Park and the softball fields and also Valley Park. Uh, then also we've done, completed some uh, annual facility small cap project. This is part of the, uh, if you recall, part of the budget was $1.6 million as for small cap. And these are some of the work that they completed, the uh, Tuttle Foy electric panel replacement in March of 2022. And you have the CSB uh, data center HVAC replacement. And also the annual small, uh, this is a underground storage at the, at the yard, uh, the replacement of that. And this was the arch project that was completed in September of 2021. And the annual sidewalk repair project that was completed, uh, it was $1.6 million uh, completed in September of 2021. And then the sidewalk repair work, some of these pictures. And these are the projects under construction. We have the Debel irrigation improvement that's still ongoing. Uh, it's scheduled to be completed this month and I'm not sure. I think they had some issues with the uh, labor and so um, there might have been a little bit of delay. I'm not sure if they're going to be able to finish it. Yes. That's the reclaimed water? Yes, that's the reclaimed water line, purple line. And the annual residential paving project, as I said earlier, they're actually in construction at this time. And you can see the uh, field where, where they go lay out, take measurements. And then the grinding and the paving and the compaction right behind it. So who in one of the uh, cool facts about this project, it's the largest paving project in Burbank's history. Um, as you see, just under $8 million, and we're doing about um, 26 miles of roadway. This is, yes, all residential for this program. And the annual residential paving, we have the uh, funded by Measure P construction sign that's in there. This show the residents that is being funded. And that concludes uh, the presentation. And I am available for any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Good presentation. Do we have questions? Yes, Mr. Brennan. Real quick question. Uh, it came up in last meeting with regards to uh, when you're redoing a, a lawn for either golf or playing soccer, was there a decision made whether to go with artificial turf or um, just do without? I'm just curious about that. It seemed the, like the director for, uh, uh, for, was uh, being hammered by uh, <laughs> protesters. Yeah, I was so just curious what happened. For Brace Park, uh, actually, they it's currently grass, but they're converting that to artificial, artificial mm -hmm. turf because it's on top of a reservoir, mm -hmm. so we can't uh, irrigate the, uh, the, the grass there. So that's the only park that we're actually working on as far as conversion. Uh, beyond that, I don't believe we have any uh, parks project that has a, a project, I mean, a field uh, expansion. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Mr. Pavanese. Thank you. Uh, just a simple question regarding the Glenox Boulevard arterial. What's the limit of the project? That is the entire length within the city, so about two miles. And we are doing signal upgrades or paving. What are the scopes? It's complete signal uh, infrastructure upgrades and some pedestrian amenities. And we are paying from Measure S funds for the project, or it's it is a Measure R, R and um, we confirmed the meeting in July with the Metro Board. They awarded that portion of the additional funding that we needed, which um, you saw in your request as we developed the budget. So. Happy to report at this meeting, we are receiving that money, so that project is moving forward. Right. Um, is there a plan to coordinate with uh, future BRT for the signal upgrades, just in case? In general, we um, always coordinate with Metro as, as far as any uh, transit improvements with our signal systems. 
with their their routes um, as applicable. No, I mean uh, what I meant is like for the possibility of future BRT coming in to use their funds to improve even more infrastructure on the corridor part of the BRT or have their Metro project they would fund with their funding. I'm not sure which funds they are using, but um, we don't have any specific conversations to say since your BRT is coming on Glen Oaks, give us some money for our yeah. signal infrastructure um, project. Do we have a plan to do that in the future? When well, the with, with the major, yeah. yeah. There's, there's yeah. lots of um, conversations going on, I'll say, about the BRT project, and how it's coming through our city, um, how it's going to impact Olive Avenue uh, Bridge, for example. And mm -hmm. so there's, there's a lot of what's going on conversations. How are we going to fund this major improvement? And how does it specifically improve it? Uh, Burbank residents and businesses. Um, so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. More questions? Yes, Mr. Vandenberg. <laughs> Mr. Vice Chair, thank you. It's just an observation that piggybacks the, what is just discussed right now, the coordination that needs to happen. Mr. Han, with respect to the olive sparks verdugo intersection, I'm assuming that this current consultant that is working on an alternative uh, is more than aware of what the response has been from the neighborhood and the immediacy of the urgency from this chicken, just chicken place that is adding to, the, to everybody's headaches. Uh, I, I just want to make sure no one misses the opportunity to, to give him the, that information to make sure that it's, because it's only a block away, you know, two blocks away. Sorry, um, they're taking everything into consideration and obviously the city staff is actually downloading them with all the, the history behind the project. Great, this is one of these crazy, you know, six, uh, s streets coming together, or three streets coming together for you know, intersections from six directions of traffic. That th there's there are simple solutions, but no one will be ever happy with any of the solutions. And that goes back to how much outreach can your department do, or through CDD or whoever is in charge of that outreach, to try to convince the neighbors that a solution is going to be better than this. Oh, don't impact me issued, you know, don't call the sack my street because it'll impact the next street, yeah. don't, don't, you know, change the, the, the turning directions to right turn only, all of that. Eventually, the solutions are there, but we're going to have to do more outreach, I think. It's just, it, it's just an observation simply because this is kind of very close to that current hot zone of people who are angry, you know, which is unfortunately what drives people. Sadly. And board, uh, member Van Der Boer, just to, for clarity for the board, um, it is in CDD transportation planning's uh, court, and they are looking at um, a review. I believe when I updated council during the their CIP budget uh, overview, um, I want to say it's February that I think we're supposed to come back, um, but don't quote me on that. But it is in the works, and it is a complicated intersection. And my personal story when I drove in my first day of work up Olive. I looked at it and I said, boy, this is a beautiful place for a roundabout. But that's, that's me. I love my roundabouts. I'm, I'm, I'm from the East Coast. And that's, and that's the kind of response we get. But anyway, um, I wasn't here to throw that in there. But um, yes, very complex. And we're working together with CDD on it. Thank, thank, thank you, you, by the way, on the roundabout. I just, I just flew back for this meeting from uh, Washington. And I enjoy my roundabouts. Uh, by the way, we're at it in my lifetime there in the last few years, and they're very, very useful. But I take it everybody has an opinion. That's the problem, is we cannot get to the solution without somebody being unhappy. But, but no solution is worse, in my opinion, having lived you know, three blocks or four blocks from that intersection. So th thank you, by the way. I know this is uh, our opportunity to talk about the extent of what successes there have been and the paving successes and the repairs are clearly visible and I hope we continue and we get into the slurry um, expenditure so that we can maintain the streets that have been just redone in the last few years so that they, we continue to have that sense of real pride in our streets. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Van Uh Do we have more questions? I have a couple quick ones then. Um, I, 
in the slides that you showed us in the, some of the parks, there, there was seemed to be a fair amount of grass. Uh, I saw the one, the, the Debell, there was the pink or purple, whatever, uh, pipe, which means that's reclaimed water up there doing the uh, uh, driving range. Uh, the other parks, uh, the ball fields, some are going to have artificial turf. Do the other parks have reclaimed water, or are we going to have brown fields, uh, not not the uh, toxic brown fields? <laughs> but uh, yeah. Well, Mr. Chair, every opportunity that we get, and I'm speaking for um, BWP, Water Operations, and Parks and Recreation, uh, together we seek the opportunities to branch out and build out a master system of our recycled water everywhere we can, both through our own capital projects and infrastructure investments, as well as when development comes in and we condition them to say there's a recycled water main there, you're going to be putting in landscaping, so expand, you know, extend the purple pipe up to your property so we can have recycled water. So in the big picture, um, we seek every opportunity to expand the recycled water network. I can't personally answer um, which parks have recycled water now, but we certainly seek to uh, take advantage of every opportunity we can to get the purple pipe to those parks and other developments. All right, thank you. Um, my other question, and I've probably belabored it more than uh, I should, but the police fire headquarters flooring. Um, there was $350,000 budgeted from prior years before uh, measure uh, 534 or P534. Uh, I see we've spent $129,000. What have we gotten for $129,000? The hundred that was spent within the last three years, uh, I believe it was. I'm not sure of all the details. Actually, that's something we would have to do some history. That was actually spent before we actually, uh, uh, before I got here. Okay. Um, why I keep bringing this up, you know, is in the out years, uh, 2023, 2024, uh, 2025. We're we're, we're proposing. You're proposing to. Uh, dedicate uh, nearly three quarters of a million dollars more. I think it's 700,000. You know, this past week I had the opportunity to take a tour of um, um, Disney Elementary School. Uh, Mr. Brennan and I were on the oversight bond committee for a number of years. And uh, Larry Cross, the director of, of finance, uh, no, excuse me, of, of facilities, uh, gave the tour for some of the school board members and some uh, of, of the oversight board members. And uh, it's, it's a very nice building. It's a two-story modular construction. Um, I think it has probably about 10 classrooms in it. Um, and when they got the buildings from, from the, the, the company that built the modular units, they didn't have foundation, obviously. They didn't have roofs, and they didn't have flooring. I was surprised to, to learn that. I mean, there was the basic uh, subflooring. And uh, Larry was pointing out the one in this one classroom was special because it, it didn't have toxic glues, and it was able to be assembled. And I asked him how much the flooring cost, and he said about $6 a square foot. And the numbers you're proposing are on the order of $100 a square foot. And, you know, it just, I'm skeptical. And I, you know, this isn't on our agenda, Mr. City Attorney. And, but, you know, I hope the next time, or I demand the next time that this item comes before us the next fiscal year, that you be able to explain fully why the amounts are so astronomical. All right, that's <laughs> that said. Vice Chair Jackson, I, I actually think that uh, you actually couched that within the update, so that that's fine. I, I think Seth gets that um, the sense that next time when an update does get presented that they include some more information on that, so I think that that's, uh, message is clear. All right, thank you. Mr. Vice Chair, can I oh, pick yes. up on something you said? And, and I don't know, again, to what extent our oversight board here has any opportunity to say this, but we are facing a water shortage. You know, that's a 
across the nation in so many places, and certainly for us here it's fairly extreme. In about a few weeks here, or for two weeks, we're not supposed to water your lawns, et cetera. Are, are we missing, again, an opportunity to look at the bigger picture as we fund projects with this recycled water that, in essence, basically we treat it as, well, it's recycled water, therefore we can throw it out there and water lawns and, uh, you know, let it evaporate, let it, you know, like, I, my watering at home is all underground. You know, I changed that probably 10 years ago or so. You know, it saves water. But at the end of the day, most people don't do that. It costs money. It's, it's very expensive. I think that we send the wrong message. And again, this is a question of, for the future of funding of projects. Uh, you know, we send the wrong message when we rely on this recycled water and now have this wonderful, beautiful golf course uh, you know, place. And not only is a golf course, but so many other places. Um, and people have a, a mixed signal, in my opinion. As a community, we say, well, gee, I, you know, I went and hit a bucket of balls up there, and it looks beautiful. Why can't I water my uh, lawn? And I don't know what the answer is to that, but I just say it as a member of the board and an opportunity to discuss this simply because it's the issue of watering, et cetera, and using recycled water is just in front of us. How, do we, how the heck do we learn to communicate better? And I mean, I, I'm one of those crazy people, so I would be happy to drink, you know, toilet to tap water. I mean, that's, you know, it's a horrible way of describing it, but at the end of the day, we should maybe, we should be looking at this water and being a little more cautious and not just using it to water lawns, but rather say, have it more available so that we don't rely on the Colorado River water or on, or on the state you know, system that is limping, limping along. I don't know if, if this is appropriate or not, but it's, I throw it out there for all of our colleagues to think about it in their own lives and, and what we do about water usage. All right, I'll mull that one over. Uh, oh, yes, Mr. Brennan. Uh, comment to Mr. Vanderborst's comments. Um, actually, what we're looking at, you know, the problem is it's, you could say it's a, a cultural. For example, uh, my wife's from New Jersey. She loves to have a lawn. I'm from Southern California. Grew up here, and like uh, most of my associates that I was growing up were Mexican-Americans. I would like to see northern Mexico type front yards, <laughs> okay? But uh, can't get that. So Mr. I think, Chair, I think we're, we're off topic a little, a little bit. bit. <laughs> a little bit yeah, of a, that's uh, what hey, I was about minute, to know, say. It's, it's, it's a cultural, cultural thing, though, and yeah. I think we should be thinking about in terms okay. of like, how do you landscape? Uh, you're in a desert environmentally. Yeah. That's the way it really is. Whether it rains or not, you're living in a desert. Yeah. So that's the way you should plan your landscapes. Well, Mr. Chair, I can, yeah, I can loop I this back into a pertinent discussion right. by saying <laughs> when it comes to the city's business uh, with BWP and with parks and any um, BWP is an enterprise funded entity. Um, so when it comes to parks and, and your purview of 534 and projects that come through, parks is definitely looking at the best fit um, for sustainability when it comes to turf or when it comes to uh, natural grasses or, or other materials as they see them come through the industry, we definitely have a sharp eye on that. And um, it certainly is in everybody's uh, front of their minds to make sure we're doing this the right way because of the situation that we're in. So we appreciate the thoughts and we will definitely continue to pass them on to our colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Burr. All right, I think we can now move on to item number H, which is introduction of additional agenda items. Do we have any additional agenda items? None from staff, sir. My colleagues? All right, then we'll move on to item I, which is pending agenda items. Uh, we have September, the election of the chair and vice chair, and we should have done that today and had Tamara Again, as chair, but <laughs> but so be it. Uh, October, we have fiscal year 21-22 infrastructure funding financial report and rescheduling of the November-December meetings because we will fall on Thanksgiving and almost Christmas. And then uh, the November-December 
is Metro Holly North Hollywood to Pasadena bus rapid transit project update and the first and second quarter fiscal year 20. Right, okay, thank you. Yeah. And then the final one, future uh, date uncertain, is a workshop discussion on de further defining our role of IOB, and I think this is Mr. Vanderborg's uh, request. Uh, you know, you're running out the clock. I don't know about M Mr. Vanderborg, but you know, my term is up uh, next spring or early summer, and I'm, I'm not gonna be bat around any longer. And I think Mr. Vandenberg has somewhat similar uh, feelings. Anyway, Mr. Vandenberg, you wanted to say something oh, on that point. I, I just wanted to say in our immediate agenda, didn't we all attend some two-hour conference, a Zoom meeting? Uh, have you all done that already, which has had to do with building team, et cetera? Dialoguing. Uh, dialoguing, dialoguing. Were, were we not having some kind of a follow-up on that? I, I was under the impression that there was going to be a, an in-person meeting. The city training? Yeah, it was something with Kumbaya. Well, I know we, we have reached out to all the committees, commissions, and boards to attend that training. Um, you are correct. I think there is a part two. I'm not aware of when okay. that will be Just scheduled, but see if we need there is something coming. Okay, it may need to be added. That's uh, just a yeah. reminder. Uh, Ms. Montes would be the one to contact you about the upcoming part two, I guess, yes. Okay, well, I think we've exhausted the agenda. So item J is that we shall adjourn to our next IOB meeting on September 22nd at 6 p.m. at this location, right? And it is 739. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.